Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's really good to be here and see uh, so many of you. And uh, I, I'm the sort of person who likes to get you to do a, a lot of thinking. Okay, you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Yes. Of course you are. Okay, so as a starter for 10, I simply want to ask you to uh, think for a moment about, you, you hear that word designer baby, and what do you think of? So think about what, what comes to mind. Something should have popped in your mind pretty quickly. So turn to your neighbor and tell them what you were thinking and listen to what they said to you, okay? I want to go through a few things which might help you think about designer baby from a slightly different angle, okay? So the first one, it's the, the headings. What might count as a designer baby? Okay, and the first one I've put up here is a baby born after prenatal diagnosis, and I'm thinking first of all of amniocentesis, when uh, a pregnant mother goes to the hospital, and uh, this is a technique which was used a long time ago, there are other techniques now, it's still used, but it's to take a sample of uh, the fluid around the baby to find some of the cells that belong to the baby and decide what, uh, if there is a potential genetic disease, to genetically type those and then make a decision about the baby going forward. And an example of that would be uh, trisomy chromosome 21, which we often call Down's syndrome. So that, you think, is this a designer baby? Does it count? A baby born after prenatal diagnosis with phytoscopy. This is taking a sample of blood uh, during the development of a fetus from the uh, from near near the one of the main um, main blood vessels in the baby, guided by ultrasound, and it was used in the 1980s. It, I don't, don't know whether it's still being used, probably there's other things that have superseded it, but to take a small volume of blood and find out whether the cells that are in the blood are diseased. And there is a particular disease which affects Mediterranean, people of Mediterranean background called thalassemia, and you can have the, this disease with one chain, the alpha chains or the beta chains that make up the molecule which carries oxygen, the hemoglobin molecule. So you look for thalassemia in a fetus and then make a decision about its future. Again, does this count as designing? Now we go to something which I'm going to be talking about much more often, and that's the word PGD. It's pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And in PGD, what happens is, effectively, IVF is done, and, a, and an embryo is created in vitro. In vitro means uh, outside the body, it's in a test tube, if you like, in a, a Petri dish or some kind of sterile container. And the embryo then is uh, enabled to grow for a few days, but you take some cells, the, the clinicians, the scientists will take some cells and they will test what the, the, ge the genetic makeup when they know there's a potential disease. And I put one example there of cystic fibrosis. It's a very common disease, uh, or at least it's a common gene. The gene for um, cystic fibrosis is um, it, it, there's a, a lot of it about in the population. Um, it's got a high prevalence. And of course, if two people marry or um, have a, conceive a child, I'm a bit old fashioned, aren't I? <laughs> they marry. <laughs> um, and they have, conceive a child, then if they're both carrying one of these genes, they may not be affected themselves, but they've got a one in four chance of having a child that's got cystic fibrosis. And the chances are, in this room, you may have a family member in your wider family who actually is known as a carrier or is, uh, you know someone in your family who has cystic fibrosis. But this technique, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, is one that is used very routinely now to try and look for genetic diseases that are known about because somebody in the family 
already had, maybe they've had a child with cystic fibrosis, or they know from a family inheritance that they might be carriers. In some places, like the USA, if you want to have children, you'll be typed for cystic fibrosis gene so you know what the risk is. How about this one? PGD, pre-implantation uh, pre uh, genetic diagnosis, pre-implantation of the embryo into the uterus, the womb. PGD for Fanconi anemia, a very, uh, it's a lethal blood disease, but with tissue typing as a donor for a sibling. So in this situation, somebody has run the risk of getting this disease. So they are, the diagnosis is done, but then as well as doing the diagnosis, what happens is that they are tissue typed. And you may think, well, why are they being tissue typed? Well, the reason is because if you're doing this technique, it means there's someone else in the family, usually, that's got the disease, a brother or a sister, potentially it's usually a brother, and you're then able to, say, actually the trouble with this is often or sometimes there is not available for the child that's got the disease, they may not have a very well matched donor to give them something healthy, bone marrow that's healthy. So in the course of testing for the other, uh, for the child that you want to have another child who might have the disease, you tissue type or it's tissue typed. This is all regulated by the Human Fertilization and Embryology uh, um, Organization. But this time, the tissue typing is actually so that the child, when it's born, the blood cells from the um, umbilical cord can be harvested, kept. There's all these words that we use in the medical world, but they can be retained and frozen and used potentially as a graft to help the other child, perhaps change their lives and, and cure the disease. Is this designer, think about this one, is this designer baby land? Next one. Actually, you're having a child this time, or somebody's having a child, Actually, they're not at risk of the disease because there are other diseases which a child might get, but they're very, very rare. They're not carried by the parents. They are what we call a spontaneous mutation. And a number of years ago, there was a child born uh, with a, another bone marrow disease, Black Van Diamond Syndrome. Actually, the next child wasn't going to, any other children wouldn't have been at risk at this. This is a, a very rare mutation that happened in that child's development, in its development from an embryo or uh, the genes uh, in the um, mother's egg or, uh, were, were partly responsible, mutation there. And this time, though, you have another child, they're not at risk, but you type them and use them as a donor for their sibling, even though they're not at risk of catching, of having the disease. Yeah? Is that design, is that a designer baby? <laughs> I'm working you, we're going down a list here. <laughs> Some of you will cross over earlier than others, we'll see. How about this one? Prenatal, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for a disease which is invariably fatal within 20, within 20 years. So there's a disease that you know um, when you're having a child, you might be at risk from because it's in the parents. And actually this one is definitely, almost always kills people within 20 years. Okay. What would you do? Is it designing? Next one, PGD for a disease which is often fatal within 50 years. Next one, PGD for a disease which is very painful to live with and for which there is no current treatment. <laughs> 
Next one, PGD for a disease which is very painful to live with and for which there is good current treatment. PGD for a disease which affects 10% of people very seriously, but 90% have relatively few syndromes, uh, symptoms. Do you feel differently about any of the ones you've just seen coming up? A baby born after PGD for a life-limiting disease which may not affect them, but might seriously affect their children and generations to come. You know, I've been showing all these slides, and there are more <laughs> on their way, but when I say a baby born after, actually you will have been thinking about this and saying, well, actually in most of these instances they're not going to have a baby, are they? They're going to choose one that doesn't have this. So the baby won't have these diseases, or which one of them would they not have the disease? When I started with um, amniocentesis, prenatal diagnosis, for something like Down syndrome, actually most people have that because if they've got a child, if they choose to do that, many of them will say, actually I'd like the diagnosis done because I don't want to have a child with Down syndrome. Some will do it and they'll say, we'll see what's happening. And they might choose to have them. But in all of these, many of these processes are done to find, either to select an embryo that doesn't carry a disease or to be making a decision about that. Is this design? Is this design? Can you say this? Is it, what's going on here? What are we weighing up? Okay, so this one would be for doing diagnosis for a life-limiting disease, which might not affect them, but might seriously affect their children and generations to come. What are you thinking about and feeling in terms of decision-making? Now we have something. Replacement of an embryo's faulty mitochondria using those from another embryo or egg. So this is what's called mitochondrial transfer. And as a member of the HFEA's consultation group, I was involved in, um, if you like, sounding out, consulting the, the UK population on how they felt about this idea. And what has happened, and it's actually the, we've, we've, uh, the HFEA, had, the licensing committee, has actually approved that this will, um, that this is something now that's authorized, it's allowed, it's permitted, but it's under license, it's overseen very carefully, and then once the, the process is licensed, which it has been, then there are decisions about particular families who have a, a history of disease which is linked to these mitochondria. The mitochondria um, come from your mother's line and they are, if you like, the battery packs of your cells. But they have their own genes, DNA is the material that makes up the genetic material, which can become mutated, there can be some mistakes in it, so it's not so effective. There's lots and lots of mitochondria, but the number of those that are uh, mutated may increase so that you have enough of them that are flawed that the person who's got the, these faulty mit uh, mit mitochondria will actually have very serious um, and life-threatening and life-limiting disease. But actually, they may you may not even notice, somebody may have low levels of these and not know that they're passing them on to their children until the next generation. So what's happening here is you're taking one mother's, the, the, the mother's, the mitochondria from a donor, another woman, and using those either from an egg or from an embryo that's been created and using 
the mitochondria, the healthy ones, to replace the faulty ones in the person who wants to have a child and know there's a risk. Is this design of babies? This, of course, is the technique which goes by the name, completely a misnomer, I believe, of uh, four-parent or three-parent embryos. Is this a designer baby? You use PGD to select for a boy or a girl. How about this one? PGD to select for a child who will grow up without or with congenital deafness. There have now been, in the deaf community, there are a number of, there's communities of deaf people, some of you may know them, so you might be one yourself, who actually believe that there is something very special to be treasured about being in the deaf community, and if you want to have a child, two deaf people, they'd like to have a child that's deaf. So to select for deafness, not against it. Is this design a baby land? A baby born after PGD to select for their mathematical ability. We finally arrived where you thought, some of you thought we might be going. <laughs> or for their beauty, or for their musicality, or for their intelligence, or whatever. I wish somebody had selected a bit better for my mathematical ability, frankly. It's, well, that's the point. There isn't an obvious gene for mathematical ability. And in fact, how many things that people talk, wouldn't it be great to, is there a known gene? But remember, since we've been able to um, effectively map the human genome, it was originally the mapping of the human genome is like, imagine you'd never seen a car before, okay? And gradually you and your pals took apart a car so that you knew all the component parts. Well, you knew, you had it all in pieces and you said, we've got this thing, we've got this thing, but actually you didn't know what the battery was, you didn't know what the engine was, you just knew what was in there, but you didn't know what it did. And that's what's been happening over these decades now, um, to try and say, well, we, we've got, this is a, we know that's a gene because it's got a start and it's got an end, but we don't actually know what it does yet. And we don't know how it links with other genes. So there's a whole project of finding out, and, and the technology is going in leaps and bounds, what genes, what this gene does, and then finding out how those genes are operating by all sorts of interesting um, mechanisms. So we've got, we, we know what's there, but we don't know what all the genes do and we don't know what combinations do. But here we have one of those things, this is what people will talk about, isn't it, when they talk about designer, designer babies. But what I wanted to do by showing you all those other aspects is that where does all this start and what's designing and do we need a little bit of a bigger context? Because what are we doing when we're making decisions about particular genes and about uh, it, uh, whether we want individuals with those genes and why not, and how we are as a society in the way we treat our genetic makeup. You know, are we, are some of the, think, uh, some of the thinking that we're doing about this sort of idea is going to be flowing from some of the things we've been doing for quite a long time. Here's another one, a baby born after cloning from a skin cell. In theory, possible. I think it'd be extremely difficult. I think most of you would probably say, oh, that's a designer baby, all right. Um, how about this one? A baby born after inserting a gene, taking the embryo, and 
after a lot of research, realizing that there's a way of giving human beings the um, ability to have their own vitamin C. So we don't have to buy it from Zipvit or anyone or eat oranges anymore because we're producing it. And you could think this in a lot of different ways in places where there are issues for people because of vitamin deficiencies or things like that. Yeah, people have got all sorts of ideas. And in, in with animals, because although we talk design of babies took us down the human line, but the whole idea of if it, what we call genetic engineering is can we grow things, can we uh, produce things in plants, uh, in animals, that actually go on to make them uh, stronger, fitter, better for us in some way that we can use them. So, are you now clear as to what counts as a designer baby? Or are you a bit more confused? That's good. I want you to be a bit more confused. Because we need to lay this out on a much bigger landscape. This morning, I was at, uh, well, and this afternoon, I was in uh, a licensing committee for the HFEA. There are various different committees that the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority has. And the one I was part of today was where we are licensing mainly clinics who are help, you know, doing, uh, uh, helping uh, people to have children. That's the main thing, so IVF clinics. But also some research. We were licensing research procedures and some of those use uh, embryos. Some of them use created em embryos which are cr created specifically for the experiments and some are embryos which will probably never be used because they were intended to be children, uh, but actually there were more embryos than the people wanted, so they, they've had two children, let's say, and they donate them for research. And some of you will feel that's a completely wrong thing to do, and others that people will say, well, that's better to do that than to just allow them to be destroyed. We can talk about that at some point if you want to. But the, the point being is that's one aspect of what the um, HFEA does. I was, in, earlier last year, I was involved in the committee, I, was, I actually chaired the committee that authorized the mitochondrial, uh, the, the first, if you like, that we're ready to go in some subjects into some um, people who are worried that if they have any more children, their mitochondria, their children will be very sick. There's another group called the, the a committee called the Statutory Approvals Committee, SACS, S-A-C. Now this is quite, uh, this is a, going to be a really difficult committee because this is where all the genes, people are discovering, as I said, more and more, what is the gene that causes or is associated with some condition. When genetics started to begin to get into the sort of level of power that it is now in our society, in Western societies, um, the Statutory Approvals Committee would um, basically say there is a condition. They would say this is a condition and we're going to authorize pre-implantation diagnosis in order for it to happen, for, to see whether um, a, a potential family, a child, uh, uh, an embryo is going to suffer with this particular condition. But what's happened is, as genetics has improved, now we're getting all sorts of different genes which cause, or are thought to cause, diseases. And the questions are getting more complicated. And one of the reasons they're getting more complicated is because of some of the things I put up on the designer you know, does this sound like design a baby to you? And that kind of issue is one where uh, it, it goes into some uh, things I'm going to put up on a slide, and I'm not quite sure where it's going to come up, so I'll, I'll go back to it in a moment. But just, I'll come back to that point. 
a designer baby? Is it selecting against a genetic inheritance or for one? Because we tend to think it's trying to put something in there or select for it, it's designing. But actually in a way, saying we don't want this could be construed as designing. Clearly, there are some things which feel a lot more like you're designing, like the, you know, the sort of idea of somebody, uh, a mathematical or intelligence gene, not that there is one. Does it benefit the potential client, cut child, or is it for somewhere else? Do you remember there was the choice of somebody's tissue type in order to help another person? So you're not at risk of a disease, but you're being tissue typed before you even come into the, you know, before you're born, because you might be a provider for your brother or your sister. Then there's that question about the severity or seriousness. Do you remember I put up the slide? What about when you've got a disease which actually doesn't appear till the 50s? Or it's a disease which only affects 10% of people. How do you make decisions about what you might offer PGD for? And this is something that is really vexing the people who try and think on behalf of society and try and exercise wisdom, wisdom to make decisions about what is a good thing to do or right thing to do and to authorize, and what isn't. So let me give you an example of something. Uh, well, well, if we wind the clock back, um, people used to be, uh, it, it, the cleft palate was something that you might be offered a termination for if a child was known to have tough cleft palate years ago. Of course, now the surgery can deal with it. In fact, we would think you don't do you don't do this sort of surgery, you don't abort or not choose an embryo because of something like cleft palate. But in the case that um, I'm thinking about, in the uh, the 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 work that um, the statutory approvals committee had to do, it was an incident of a disease which actually is quite serious when a child's born, but the child can have surgery. It's quite disruptive surgery, but once it's sorted, it will be okay. But people are anxious about putting a child through surgery in their first two years of life. They might have to have three operations. But in fact, the, the, the group decided that this is not something we should authorize because actually children can get through that fine. But some people would want to say, actually, let's just get rid of it altogether. We don't want that anymore. Severity or seriousness, that the, um, the HFEA had to make decisions some years ago as to were they only going to offer pre um, implantation genetic diagnosis to diseases which were likely to kill people or were extremely serious and life limiting or they do it for they changed the definition to severe but what's severe and judging what's severe is not straightforward the age of onset I mentioned about you know will, will influence what you think you're trying to do and current treatments. The likelihood of being affected or passing on. Are we engineering or engineering a person? So that's the, the kind of when you start to think about changing their genetics in some way. Are we engineering when we do mitochondrial transfer? Or are we doing something a little bit more like offering, if you like, a genetic organ? Is it more like a blood transfusion or an organ transplant than it is genetic engineering? And the decision that most people would make around that is it's more, it's a bit between the two, but it's, it's not something where you're really interfering with the whole, you know, the, who a person is 
when you replace their mitochondria. So, I'm going to just take you through a few genetic terms briefly, which are the, uh, address these things before going on to say something about, so where does a Christian mind come into these things? And where, where does playing God come in here? So, we talk about a genotype, meaning the genes that you've inherited. So, this is where if somebody has got um, cystic fibrosis, they'll have uh, two genes, two particular genes, one from mum, one from father, which are mutated so that the, the protein they code for is not functioning properly. But you could be a carrier, you could have one healthy one and one flawed one from, your, uh, from one of the parents and one from the other. But genotype is the type, the genes that you've actually inherited, the building blocks. Genes can be dominant, recessive, or X-linked. So a dominant gene, if you got something from one parent which was dominant and was something that would, would be flawed in some way, you would get the disease. If it's a recessive one, you need two. And that'll be w worth remembering in a moment when I talk about something else. And then there are genes which are on the X chromosome, uh, on the X chromosome, and on the, the male defining chromosome, the Y chromosome, they are not present because they've got that, there's a, you know, a Y is smaller than X, let's just put it at that. And the one gene is enough to give you a disease, if it's a disease gene. So carriers, I've mentioned about cystic fibrosis. There is a lot of carriers. I think it's, it's something like one in seven. It's a very large amount of people carry. Sorry? One in 20. One in 20. It's quite high. One in seven does sound a bit high, doesn't it? But it's a, it's, that's pretty prevalent, one in 20. And cystic fibrosis, you, when you're making a decision about a cystic fibrosis embryo, do you make a decision to take the one that has no disease, or do you take the one that has both normal? I'll come back to that. Phenotype is the characteristic that a gene produces. So it's, it's what the gene actually looks like in terms of the characteristics of an individual. Penetrance is the frequency that you might observe this in a population. And in looking at um, the work that SAC does, the Statutory Approval Committee, Approvals Committee, th the way that the law has been framed and the way that the, the people who try and uh, discern what to do in this work is they will be considering what's the worst this disease can be like before making a decision whether we will authorize the testing of it, testing for it. So you look for the very worst effect, not the lightest effect. And that means it will always be biased towards the worst thing that's going to happen. Expressivity is the variation in any one individual of how a gene is expressed. Phenotype, the characteristic, maybe sometimes it's a bit less in, some, in, in one individual than others, depending on what's going on in their genes. So, let's carry on here. What was it about cloning that most would recognize as playing God? Just think about that for a minute. What is it? What is it that drives you to say, yeah, that's clearly playing God? Well, here's some thoughts. It denies the inherent uniqueness of a person's identity. What is precious about human beings is that actually we're this wonderful random assortment that happens when um, the sperm and the egg are together when fertilization happens and the unique combination that happens then is something that models a uniqueness and a freedom and in fact freedom is an important one a clone is is more of a product than a gift 
It's, it's like manufacturing or making. And there's a lack of freedom in that there's a choice made by others. I choose somebody if it ever happens, and I, you know, we all know the world is a place where there will be somebody who's mad enough and somebody who's clever enough to actually bring a clone into a human clone into being at some point in the future. There's a lack of freedom in that you're chosen by others. And I've heard some um, so-called ethicists, well, you know, people who are employed to bioethicists, say that actually, well, a clone is the same as an identical twin, really. It's just that you've got somebody with the same genetic makeup of you, but a clone isn't, is it? Because of all the things we've mentioned, it's actually not the product of some random event. It's, all, it's the product of somebody deciding and choosing to have this kind of individual brought into the world after their own likeness. As you went through the things that, um, when I asked you the questions about, is this a designer baby? A lot of the things were about the movers are actually about the desire to prevent suffering, to alleviate suffering, either in an individual or in others. And that influences our decision making. Is that playing God? How do we weigh suffering and freedom and the level of suffering? Tissue typing when PGD is not needed for an embryo. Choosing a carrier in the case of cystic fibrosis. Do you have somebody who, who doesn't carry the gene or do you look for somebody uh, who might be, uh, just doesn't have the, the potential to have the disease or not? And interestingly, in Europe, they will be very happy to say, look, for, get rid of the gene. But in this country, we'll say it's not whether there's going to be a gene there, it's whether the person is likely to have the disease. So it's about the disease, not trying to design it out, not trying to get rid of it. And then... Actually, I obviously didn't do the right thing with this one because it was supposed to come one at a time, but you're getting it all in one go. <laughs> and this is where I want to sort of close before we give time for some wine or whatever other drinks you want to choose. I want to think about this just briefly from the treasury of Christian w wisdom. You know, remember that our society is actually deeply embedded with the Christian faith. A lot of the things, our laws, our um, ethical thinking, sometimes it's forgotten what it's based on in history and what it's grown up with. Um, nowadays, of course, there's all sorts of things coming together. Well, the Christian foundation offers these kind of insights to us. And they start with the fact that human beings are made in the image of God. That there is something uniquely precious about who human beings are, and it's not about whether we've got a disease or whether we're wonderfully uh, mathematical, athletic, or what have you. And indeed, to give you an example, I posed a question to parliamentarians several years ago when there was a debate over whether uh, it should be possible to authorize putting a human nucleus into an, the egg of a rabbit or a cow to see whether the, there was a real shortage of being able to work on embryos. So to make a sort of artificial human rabbit or human cow embryo, that would be useful for testing various things. And obviously this was a bit controversial. And the question was, um, if a mad scientist who was also extremely clever managed to do this and they snuck it into a pregnant woman so that the product was born, what would come out? Would it be a human being 
Would it be a rabbit or a cow or what? What do you think, folks? <laughs> I don't know what the parliamentarians thought, but the point was it was raising, first of all, the question of ambiguity. There's an ambiguity there. But the second thing was, if, if it were possible, I mean, I'm sure the genetics wouldn't work out at all, but if it were possible to do that kind of uh, horrible thing, and a human being a bit like, was born in the way, a little bit like Dolly the sheep, is what the, the background is, that would be, I, I would say that would still be a human being, but somebody terribly sinned against, to use that word, we don't use that much anymore terribly sinned against by the rest of humanity or some in humanity but there would be something recognizably human and it makes us ask ourselves about about the sanctity of humanity it makes us ask about the about genetics and what makes us human but it also gives us a perspective which looks with both compassion and horror in these things. Christian wisdom has invited us to think through what's the status of the embryo. And as you'll probably know, that people don't all agree. agree. Some Christians will say as soon as an embryo is established, it's going to be a person. Well, it is going to be a person if it makes it. But actually, the embryos, maybe 60%, 70% of embryos, don't implant. And also, they can divide into two or three before 14 days. So these are questions about the personhood. And some Christians, including myself and uh, indeed Steve, would say, actually, we can't say that embryo is a person, so there is a respect and value attached to it but we're not saying we treat this like a person. We have to be incredibly respectful, and that's the position we've taken as a society. But all the time there are things which will drag us in different directions. The mandate to heal, to alleviate suffering, is deeply embedded in the Christian faith. And so what we do to heal is something we feel is, um, if you like, given to us an impulsion from God. It's not playing God, it's what God wants to be doing to alleviate suffering. And we practice virtue, yet we recognize limits. In other words, there must be some things that we will not do because they infringe the very nature of what it is to be a human being. And that's where the uh, cow-rabbit uh, experiment comes in as well. Humans are always to be ends, not means. And if you think about some of the things I've already talked to you about, the question around siblings being donors for, other, for, their, uh, for an unborn sibling being a donor for a child that's got a disease does cross that line of what is an end and what is a mean. But can we hold them together with love? Can we hold them together with love? And we hold tensions all the time in these kind of thoughts. It's not that this is clearly, there are things which we as a society, which um, I've already mentioned in cloning, that seems to infringe what it is to be a human being deeply. But there are other things which we might have thought, oh, I don't like that. But when you think about it just in the way we're doing today together, you may say, actually, this seems to be a very, you know, I, I can't say this is not right to do. Some people might not like it. Some people might find it difficult. But there is something here that is worth doing and trying to do wisely. So as we kind of conclude for some drinks, I think one of the things I've been trying to get you to think about as we think about the whole area of designer babies is are we trying to basically design out things from the gene pool? 
And I think that's something we need to be very careful of. A number of years ago, when I was a biology student at school, I remember learning about sickle cell anemia. Did anybody else learn about sickle cell anemia at school? And what, what, what I remember there was, it's, it's a very uncomfortable, painful disease suffered largely by um, people uh, of uh, you know, an African descent, Negro descent. And the paradoxical thing is that this, when people have the full, both recessive, these genes which give them sickle cell anemia, clearly they're very ill regularly. But if they get one normal gene and one sickle gene, they seem to be better able to cope with malaria. So there's something about, you know, well, let's stamp out this bad gene. Well, actually, what's it going to do to other things? There's something richer here. Gene splicing to repair embryos and perhaps adult diseases. This is where we're really getting into what some people are anxious about. In the last few years, some amazing technology has appeared, which means like a pair of scissors, you can cut out a gene and replace it with another gene. Gene splicing. At the moment, it's being um, used in experiments uh, to try it largely to try and find out what a gene does. You remember I said about taking the car apart and you don't actually know what it does? Well, if you do a bit of gene splicing, you can actually very carefully begin to find out what it does. You can switch it off or switch it on. You can manipulate it. But there is the possibility that you could correct some diseases. At the moment, we may... Um, have diseases which we, we offer people terminations for, or we select, uh, we select embryos which are carrying a particular disease, some people hope that it might be possible to cut those genes out and, if you like, repair an embryo. The thing about that is we've already got techniques which do the same thing by selecting an embryo that isn't diseased. So is this really needed, is a big question. But what about adult diseases? We can't, that's a, a whole new ball game which maybe will come up um, later. But that is a, this is a technology which is going to really start to open uh, horizons and questions. Do we want to be improving human capacity and capability? Is that something? that we want to see? Is it something that is playing God? Or is it something that is about being a human being? And what kind of capacities? And what else might we do? The thing about the improving uh, human capacity and capability, it's what's the end in mind. And actually, is it the sort of thing which reflects more about what we are as human beings human beings together, or is it for individual, uh, is it for individuals who will be able to have that and not the whole community to benefit from it? Is it about gain, or is it about enriching society? Those are the kind of questions there. So why you have a drink and mull over some of the things you've heard or you wish you'd heard, uh, it's over to you. Next. Let's start with uh, one or two about uh, the role of the HEFA. Here's one. Do you wear your dog collar in the committee meetings? In other words, are you there as a bishop or as a scientist when you go to the HFEA? Uh, actually, as both. <laughs> I go there as Lee Rayfield. Um, and I, I, well, I, I wore my dog collar, collar today because coming here tonight, so I thought I ought to wear it. I don't always. But I do in the public meetings because, in fact, I was appointed to be somebody who could build bridges. And um, Steve mentioned earlier that uh, I, and in fact he, uh, we're both associated with the um, Society of Ordained Scientists.
And it's, it's a holy order, actually. Uh, it's a kind of prayer fellowship. And we, one of the, we have commitments to try and build bridges between uh, the church and the world in the scientific and technological endeavors. And sometimes that means um, saying where people are a bit, you know, what's going on now, it's Frankenstein stuff. Trying to say, do you know what? It's not actually Frankenstein stuff. Um, and sometimes going, hang on a minute, do you really know what you're doing here? This feels like it's really going down a road which I feel many Christians will be uncomfortable with. Actually, not just Christians, you know, I say Christians, but as a Christian, I'm there wanting to build understanding. But I, because, um, because I am a scientist and uh, a Christian, and a Christian leader in this way, a bishop, it does give me a, people will ask me to try and explain things, or I'll be able to explain things which helps to make a connection, which is incredibly helpful. Sure. I mean, this kind of picks up something you just said. If in committee you have to make a moral decision on something that fascinates you and you wish, you wish to say yes, but you feel you should say no to that thing, how do you cope with this? So something that fascinates you and you think, oh, yes, that would be, be good, but uh, then I actually feel no. How do you cope with the kind of, that's a kind of dilemma within yourself. How do you cope with a moral decision in committee about is that right to do this or not? How, I yeah. suppose that's about, where do you draw, how do you draw lines? How do you make decisions? What are the principles that you decide? Somebody else is asking. It says, uh, uh, let's have a look at the one. Um, have you any kind of, there's one that says, it seems you, I want to say, it seems you do not have any clear guiding principle to judge a situation. If you do, what is it? So how do you decide? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I do. <laughs> and I'll give you an example. So I was on the consultation uh, around whether we're going to go forward with mitochondrial transfer. So the thing that lots of, it's very complicated for people to get their heads around. Even for you know, people who've got a little bit of science, it, it can be very confusing. Now, there are some aspects of that. So for example, I, I, I know that many, um, many Christians would find it um, better or more acceptable or unacceptable to use another embryo to use the, the, um, uh, the mitochondria, you remember I said they're the battery packs, to create an embryo and then effectively to destroy it to put them into another one. When you can actually do the same thing with an egg, which actually is not ever going to be a person. Now, I've struggled with uh, the, the thing, if we don't have to do something which actually has more moral questions around it, why would we do it? So I think with the whole, the way the mitochondrial donation uh, evolved, I, did, I was really, I wish we'd got in this country onto what's called mitochondrial spindle transfer, and I know you all know what that's about. <laughs> Um, instead of pronuclear transfer, and you certainly know what that's about. One of them involves embryos, the other one doesn't. But we've made a lot of progress on the other one. So I, I wish we, you know, I, I expressed that. I said, you know, actually, if we were doing it this way, but if, it found, if we found that the mitochond maternal spindle transfer, the one using eggs, not embryos, didn't work, I might be prepared to go for the other one. Because, so it's, it's not that I'm, uh, oh, you know, you, you spin a coin and uh, I, I can go one side or the other. There are some things that I'll say, we ought to do this if we can, but I don't believe there's an immutable wall there. There is an immutable wall for cloning. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. an immutable wall. But. You can see what I was trying to do in the way I was leading you into this was get you to see that sometimes the way we think, if we put something up very straightforwardly, say, oh, shouldn't do that. But if you gradually see the connections between things, you can either say, oh gosh, I'm beginning to struggle to make my mind up where we should draw a line, or 
you say, I'm just going to stay with this one. I know where I am. Sure. And I think God, this is the God thing. Whenever we're talking about playing God, I think you've got to ask yourself, is this playing God or is it being human God's way? You see, God, the God we see in Christ um, is, is a God who it gives us responsibility, he gives us freedom. The God I know in Christ is creative. We are given creative abilities, but very often we use those creative abilities unwisely for selfish gain. And I would say some of the things that I have spoken out again, against, I've been involved in Parliament a few times um, in their subcommittees and given evidence, is where actually I hear what's going on. And I said this in the mitochondrial, um, I wrote a chapter for a book uh, which was reflecting on the journey in mitochondrial tra um, transfer. And it was this, the work was commissioned by the Secretary of State for Health and the Secretary of State for Business and commerce, and I can't remember the exact... In other words, there's, there's a sort of bit of an unholy alliance there. And um, I remember my first outing in a select committee thing uh, with Dr. Evan Harris, who used to be Liberal MP for Oxford, one of the areas in Oxford. And actually, he was out to get me because I was a Christian, mainly. Um, but it was quite clear that he was coming at it from a, this will be good for us economically. You know, actually, it's not about economics. It's about what is morally right in the end. Sure. So a question, at what stage is an embryo considered a human being? Because a lot of this is to do with what we make of embryos, what we may or may not do with embryos. You were saying with those two different yeah. methods of perhaps doing that mitochondrial transfer and bringing about healing, because that's presumably, as you're saying, that's what's behind it. It's the person from the health department that's really the person that's there, and it's about healing. Yeah. And you were saying, well, I'd rather go for the form that doesn't involve destroying embryos, but actually use eggs, and that's a whole different thing, if that'll work. Yeah. So... And a lot it may of it, not work so it well. may not work, but if we could do it that way, that's the way to do it because there is something about embryos that is special. But what do we say? At what stage is an embryo considered a human being is the question here. Well, can I start with the other end of life? What do you do when somebody dies? Do you put the person in the bin? Are they still a human being? And you're, well, are they still a human being? Well, yes, but they're slightly different, aren't they? So is there a phase at the very beginning where you treat the, the embryo with respect, but you've got some questions about whether that's truly a person? I alluded to that in the talk. So for, for, for me and many other people trying to make up our mind, um, one of the things has been, you know, there, there are many Christians, and the Roman Catholics hold this, for example, and I re totally respect them, that as soon as an egg is fertilized, you have a person. You know, that there is a connection between the moment of fertilization to the moment of death. Okay, that's, and we'd all say, actually, there is a connection. Of course there is a continuum. But there are breakpoints. And one of the breakpoints is we can't say for certain um, what happens, uh, actually, or we can say for certain that in the first 14 days of an embryo's life, you can't definitely say it's a person because it could be two people or three people in that period. So there's something different about that period. There is a moment in the... Um, development of an embryo where there is a big change that happens. It won't divide anymore into two identical, it won't have identical twins. There is, um, it, it forms something called the primitive streak and that marks a big moment. Now, I'm not saying that the moment that the primitive streak comes, that's then a person. I don't know. But what I do know is before then there's something a bit more malleable. So if you're thinking about embryos, you know, IVF 
has been a wonderful... I mean, I, I am passionate about helping people who, are, who struggle to have children. You know, infertility. You talk about the C word, cancer, there's an I word, infertility, where people's hearts ache and they, they find it very difficult to talk about it. It's a very, you know, so, um, so it's really, really something I'm passionate about. Well, when you're going down the road of IVF, which to some Christians, you shouldn't be doing it, you are going to have some embryos which are created to be babies which may end up not being usable. Nobody, you, you may say, if I, don't, I can't use these to have my own children, but maybe you'd give them away to someone else. But how many people want somebody else's embryos? Not many, to be honest. So you've got a choice of what to do there. Do you actually say, we're just going to destroy this? Or do you say, we're going to do some very limited, respectful experiments here? The, the whole concept of what the HFEA is doing, and I'm not here as an apologist for the HFEA. I'm here to help you understand what the HFEA does. And I said when I joined them, actually, there's some of the things you've approved that I'm not too happy with. And the, the then chair said, that's all right. Everybody's got some of those things. Because <laughs> it's about people who are trying to come together of people who are not all of the same mind and try and find wisdom for society. But the, the truth of the matter is, creating embryos just for experimentation is very highly regulated, and I want to see as little of that as done as possible, because those other embryos were, desi were designed. <laughs> they were meant to be children. Yeah. But the ones that are made just for experiments yeah are not meant to be anything other than something for an experiment. Do you think, personally, then, it's wrong to make that sort of embryo where they're just being made and you know it's only for experiment, it's not because they're being made as a batch of embryos that might be used to bring a child to life through IVF? What about the ones that you know are just being made for experiment? Do you think that's wrong to make them just for experiment? Uh, I don't think it's just... Well, I live with attention on that one. I really don't want us to do that but I'm glad I'm there to help regulate it. So even if I wouldn't, I'd rather not to be doing any of that. Sure. I'm there because actually the world that God gives us is one where sometimes he says, you've got to roll up your sleeves and get involved, and even if you don't really like this, actually come and bring what you do give. So it's a bit like Elijah. Elijah, the prophet, he kind of has a bit of a nervous breakdown, frankly, but he goes off, and uh, you know the sort of earth, wind, and fire piece? So he hides himself in a rock, and the God, God pass, passes by. And after this happens, sort of in the, uh, the, he's in, God's not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but he's in the still, small voice. And God says to Elijah in this great, you know, poetic thing, he says, so what's up, Elijah? And Elijah says, I'm the only one left. You know, and uh, God says, no, you're not. What is it? Is it 5,000 or 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee? 7,000, 7, uh, yeah, there you go. And um, 7,000 haven't bowed, and he's thinking, I'm the only one holding on. There's loads of people working on these things. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Now, there's some that just ask for kind of some information which you might be able to give us, really. Um, how widely is this PGD, this... Um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where you're taking a cell out of an embryo and checking whether it yeah. would suffer from disease or not. How widely is that offered? Uh, is it on the NHS? Is it uh, only for those with illnesses that they already know about in their family they might suffer from who are allowed to do it? What a good question. Uh, I think if there's anybody who absolutely knows the answer to that, I'm not totally sure of the answer to that in that... People will pay for, P you know, the thing about um, fertility treatment is it's largely done privately, largely. Yes, you can get fertility treatment through the NHS. The amount of that is going down all the time. For example, Swindon used to provide three cycles. Um, if there were, 
a, a child, if they were doing three cycles and they knew that there'd been an issue with one of the, you know, you were carrying a potential disease of the kind we've been talking about, or some of them, uh, they would uh, definitely, I'm pretty sure they would fund the PGD. But if you're doing things privately because you've had your, you know, you've had a child, it's, it's been affected, and now you're on your own paying for it, you'll have to pay for PGD. But there's more and more PGD going on. You know, it's, and it's, it's a very powerful technique. Sure. Another one asking for information. Are there any genes identified as being associated with consciousness or free will or morality? Well, I'm, I expect there are some genes, the ones that allow you to breathe. <laughs> you know, goodness me. That, that gets us into a really interesting area, which I'm not particularly well read on. But when you think about, there are, you know, the, the evolutionary biologists who would want to find explanations, uh, as many kind of, if you like, rational explanations that don't go anywhere near um, any God stuff, if I could just put it so simply. And I, I think you can have rational explanations and God stuff, by the way. It's not a, an either or. But it would be that um, we may find there are some things about the way we've evolved that would have moved us towards gradually gaining the, the ability to think morally or to react morally. But you're getting, into a, you're getting into a question of what you might call the soul. Because yes. the soul is not... I don't think the soul is our conscience, but the soul is something that is about our integrity. It's, a, it's you know, do you, have you ever said, I think I'm falling apart? at the seams, you know, and things like that. There are, there are times when we know that we're not being integrated. We're doing something against that. That question was asking, do I ever feel I'm doing something against... The, uh, actually, I'm trying to convince myself when I'm doing something wrong. I usually know when that's happening, and I try and fess up. Um, There's one here that says, philosophers, doctors and scientists are not qualified to pronounce on the existence and moment of conception of the human soul and spirit. How does this impinge on the actions and decisions made over the biological mechanisms of the human body for whatever reason? So that's actually posing that philosophers, doctors and scientists aren't qualified to pronounce on areas of the soul and the spirit. In the beginnings. And... Actually, I, I think that God has made us as beings, I've said already about creativity, as morally reflective. We make ethical judgments. We do have, if, if you talk about the soul as something which enables you to have a spirituality and a, a moral compass and to make decisions which you feel have integrity, then actually every doctor, every, every person in this room has a soul and can think about these issues they can be informed by all sorts of things. And what I believe is, you know, uh, Jesus, for example, continually used images from the world to actually illustrate, if you like, a point about the nature of life, the nature of relationship with God, the nature of being whole as a person. And so I think as many dimensions you can draw on will give you the best location on seeing on understanding what it is to be a human being made in God's image. Okay, thank you. Question here, is there a danger of aiming for a race of supermen and superwomen? Will legislation and regulation always be catching up with the science? So kind of two questions there. One, is there a danger that we're aiming for perfection of some, court, some kind? And if, if science is moving on so quickly so we can do lots more things, Will legislation and regulation always be playing catch-up for that? Um, if I can take the second part first, I think science has been really moving ahead faster than, than we can keep up with what do we really believe. Do we believe that's a good thing, whether that's a moral thing? And part of what I said about you know, business... Um, you know, business being married with health, we are... The, 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 the UK are world leaders in, in biotechnology. 
We, you know, so then that's a dangerous position to be in because we'll be pushed to get a share of the market and that might actually sometimes compromise what we should, you know, where we might, we ought to be saying, actually, should we be doing this? I worry about that. I also think that some of the situations we're coming to, as we've seen with the mitochondrial donation, that was so com fiendishly complex just to get your head round it. Then thinking through whether, the, you know, what are the moral issues that might be raised? It, it's hard enough to get your head round the science, and you have to do that before you can even think about the moral issues. You can just say, yuck, I don't like it. But, you know, the yuck factor actually doesn't carry it. That's not a wise thing. Um, there are times when yuck factor might give you a basis to start from, but you have to actually let the light of wisdom, the Holy Spirit, the kind of reason, experience, illuminate all that. And scripture, you know, I'm, I'm, scripture is really important to me and the, the Anglican Church. But it's these things hold to, held together. Um, so do I think that we are in danger of some things racing ahead. We are, but usually something that is a really big advance or potential advance, like we've just been seeing, there is something regulatory which will say, hang on a minute, and especially in the world I'm talking about, in the, you know, we've been talking about designer babies. Mm -hmm. And actually in that world, there's a lot of um, regulation. And so I think all the regulation I've been telling you about is saying we do not think a human embryo of whatever stage between zero and 14 days, you're not allowed to do anything after 14 days. Um, the, 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 the fine examination of that and the, the, the steps that people have to go to get licensed and the inspections they have says we think that this is more than just a, a bunch of protoplasm. Mm -hmm. There is a special status, but we have to keep remembering there is a special status to the human embryo because there are people in our country there might be some here, and I'm, I'm not you know, saying that in a der derogatory way, who actually think, do you know what? It is just protoplasm. Mm. Mm. But what about the question of, uh, are we aiming for perfection? Are we aiming for a race of supermen or superwomen? Is that the danger of where we might end up to as technology enables us to change more, you know, actually clip bits of the genome out and put other bits in? And what if we do find, I mean, we're miles off, but what if we did find there was, you know, that's the alterations you have to do, might be several of them, but to have a fair-haired and blue-eyed child, if we could do all those snips, would that be okay? And is that where we're heading? That you can uh, you literally do, you design a baby, get your catalogue and say, I'll have the, the fair-haired, blue-eyed one that's going to be six foot two and will be uh, academically brilliant. You know, do, you know what I, do you know what I think would happen? It would be a wonderful uh, time to be five foot two, bald, and, <laughs> and no dress sense and not athletic. Because there's something about being different <laughs> that actually we like. <laughs> so don't give up and don't start praying for these giant athletic blondies. <laughs> Somebody's asking, isn't any kind of genetic engineering or modification interfering with God's will? Uh, that's a really interesting... I've, I keep saying that, don't I? It's an interesting question because I often get asked, or, or somebody says, actually, isn't that interfering with nature, which is another side... It's the same question, just posed from a different angle. And it's actually, a theological student who I was... I was at the uh, theology college in Bristol uh, yesterday, that's right, having lunch after something, and uh, we got into a conversation and he was asking me about science and things. He said, oh, he said, but do you think we should be doing that? Isn't it, in, you know, isn't it interfering with God? And I said, do you take ibuprofen? <laughs> <laughs> and he very clearly got the message. We're interfering with nature all the time. But the question is, are there any particular places where we begin to go into an area that's sacrosanct? The, the thing that I've had to work out over the years, and particularly being a member of the Gene Therapy Advisory Committee, 
for, tw for, for uh, 10 years. That was, uh, you know, if you like, genetic engineering. Um, it's, is there something sacrosanct about DNA? And I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no. But what you might choose to do, then you need a lot more thoughtful, ethical decision making, prayerful sure. decision making. Sure. But sometimes, you know, I think God also calls us to risks. Uh, I think the God we see in Christ is a God who rolls up his sleeves and takes risks. And I think God will be more interested, you know, in the day, in the new creation, which we kind of see in, revealed in Christ. It would be a moment of, um, I need to be able to feel that when, if you like, God looks me in the eye, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen, but that I've been consistent to the faith that has been entrusted to me, so that I haven't actually done something which really I didn't believe in, but I wanted to, I wanted to not avoid pain. Yes. Somebody's asking, why do we have or need diseases? Why do these mistakes happen in creation? Well, that's, um, why do mistakes happen? Let's just take that from a completely different angle, okay? And let's think about, let's think about trisomy 21, okay? So I have a, now what is she to me? She's a sort of second cousin called Beth. And she was born, her mum had her later on in life, and she has Down syndrome. And so you could say, well, that's a terrible mistake. You know, actually, she is, there is a quality about people who have Down syndrome that actually is beautiful. And you know, the, most, the biggest thing you can do is share love with people. And diseases and, and things where, where people are physically, intellectually damaged, emotionally damaged, for all sorts of things, it calls out something of us which is deeper, more deeply human than if it weren't there. So I think to try and... We'll never stamp out suffering from the world, and it's right that we should... I think it's right that we should do... Um, be, be thoughtful about alleviating suffering. But in Christ we see the suffering God and we see that sometimes in the suffering of the world is where we really find ourselves, find our humanity, even though it's never something we would choose and it's deeply challenging, but we find something incredibly deep. So I challenge the premise. Okay. <laughs> Time's going, we'll just have one last one. Really just a question about, um, you mentioned... Uh, tissue typing and choosing to have a child that has the right tissue type to be a donor for a pre-existing sibling who's already ill, so-called saviour siblings, yeah. the ones being born yeah. is the saviour, inverted commas, of the other one because of the donation of uh, blood or whatever they're yeah. going to give. Or, um, is there yet any evidence of psychological damage to children who are born as this saviour sibling, the tissue helper for a sibling? Is there any problem you know that uh, presumably behind that question is the is the question well I, I grew up and I find I was only conceived in order to be the right kind of donor for my brother Tommy you know uh, is that is there any evidence of psychological damage to the donor the savior sibling it's a bit early I think I don't know what the time is but uh, I don't know how the old how old the does anybody know here how old the oldest savior sibling might be now 10, 12, uh, a bit more? Yeah, it will be a bit more now. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there will be psychological repercussions. That doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do, but what of, you know, one of the things that I worry about, and I really do, I really do genuinely worry about this, is the fact that so many of our young people uh, have mental health issues. Sure. You know, and... There, there's something going on in that particular age group and in the world, I guess, in Western society, um, where there are a lot of questions. Maybe some of the fundamentals that we grew up with, you know, if you're my sort of age and your sort of age, um, 
They're not there anymore. It's a complicated world. And anything can start... It's about your identity. It's about your value. And that's, again, you know, I'm, I'm bleating on a bit about Christ here. Um, but finding your identity in Christ is actually where I think every human being is called to find themselves. And you, I'm, I'm thinking of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who a little while ago, the Telegraph were going to basically expose that he wasn't the son of the person he thought was his dad. Do you remember this? And, yeah, he was... I thought he was unbelievably powerful when he said, do you know what? You know, I've come from a pretty dysfunctional... He didn't use these exact words, but I'm from a pretty dysfunctional family, frankly, but I find who I am in who Christ is to me and I am to Christ. And so I think... Yes, they're going to have identity. Things play on your mind, don't they? The chimp brain, as somebody calls it. You know, the goblins and the gremlins um, will, have, will be nagging at you. They're going to come. And hopefully the parents will love their children enough to say, I understand that. And actually, it wasn't because of this. It's because we wanted you. We wanted you. It's not that you were the the way in to save your brother or sister. We love you and we wanted you, but actually this was a great thing to do for your brother or sister. Sure. Lee, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Sorry if we haven't got through all the many questions, but thank you for offering those questions. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming tonight. Uh, you'll see from that flyer you've got, we've got one more talk in our series, Thursday, February the 8th. And... Uh, Rodney Holder is coming to speak on God or the Big Bang, question mark. Just a small subject to finish with. And uh, we're looking at the origins of everything on that night, on the 8th of February. Please come. Rodney Holder is bringing copies of his book, Big Bang, Big God, at the special price of £5 that night. So do put the date in your diary and come along with friends the 8th of February. That's another Thursday. And please fill in the feedback form before you go, if you possibly could. And there's a box at the back. It just helps us as we're planning for the next evening. If you take a moment to return that, we'd be very grateful. I'd like to thank everybody who's worked towards putting on this evening, especially the planning and hosting team. But may we close by once again warmly thanking our speaker tonight, Bishop Lee Rayfield. Thank you.